from being one of the poorest countries in Europe to becoming an economic growth champion. Dr. Rainer Zeitelmann, German historian and sociologist, visits Poland to document the effects of the unprecedented reforms that put Poland on the road from poverty and oppression toward prosperity unparalleled in its entire history. It was 1990 when the real revolution took place. It opened the economy, empowered its people and changed the country forever. Something which seemed to be completely impossible seemed to be possible. The end of the Second World War. The treaty between the Western states and the USSR put Poland in the communist bloc. Poland was formally independent, but had little freedom to make decisions on its own internal affairs. The economic model was imposed on Poland by Moscow. After the war, a planned economy was introduced in Poland. It was no longer the companies and the consumers who decided what was produced, but politicians and bureaucrats. Propaganda posters promised a perfect new world where everyone's needs would be met. Socialism was supposed to be a paradise for workers. But the system did not work. There was shortage of consumer goods everywhere. Long lines formed in front of the stores. People had to wait hours, sometimes even several days to get products. W komunizmie następował taki proces zubażania sklepów. Początkowo, jak ja miałem 5 czy 7 lat, to jeszcze był wybór towarów. I tak na początku były trzy rodzaje żółtego sera, a potem był jeden rodzaj żółtego sera. A potem to w ogóle już nie było towaru na półkach. Takim słowem kluczowym było załatwić, wykorzystując znajomości albo korumpując na przykład sprzedawczynię. W cudzysłowie zaletą tego całego systemu społeczno-politycznego było to, że miałeś bardzo dużo znajomych. Musiałeś się przyjaźnić ze sprzedawczyniami, z ludźmi, którzy właśnie pośredniczyli w, w sprzedaży towaru, mieć znajomych gdzieś na wsi. To buy a wedding cake, you had to know the person in a shoe shop, who could sell you a pair of shoes that you would then use to bribe a guy that could sell you a bicycle, that you would then give to the baker to pay for the wedding cake, for your electrician's daughter. According to Karl Marx, socialism was only a transitional stage to communism. Under communism, Marx claimed, everyone would live according to their needs. But the Poles, who stood in line to get the bare necessities of life, could only choke about Marx's vision. How will the problem of cures be solved when we reach full communism? And the answer was, there will be nothing left to stand in line for. Luckily, agriculture was saved from being collectivized as it was in the USSR. In the Soviet Union, 90% of farms were nationalized by 1960. In Poland, only 13% belonged to the state. The communists tried to force the peasants into collectivization. But the resistance of the peasants was so great that most of Poland's agriculture remained in private hands. Ciekawym towarem były jajka. Przez bardzo długi czas jajka były towarem, cenę którego określali sprzedawcy i rolnicy. Zresztą bardzo dużo rolników przyjeżdżało do Warszawy, żeby te jajka sprzedać. No i w pewnym momencie partia wydała taki przepis, ustawę, że cena jajek jest sztywna. I w tym momencie na drugi dzień już nie było ani jednego jajka w sklepie. The communists called profit theft, but fewer and fewer people believed such propaganda. The only option the state had left was coercion. The list of suspected citizens included 6 million names, 30% of the nation's adult population. Everyone could be imprisoned for a lot of reasons, including being repeatedly late at work or missing the 1st of May parade. Mistakes at work were sometimes interpreted as sabotage, and some people went to jail only for making a joke about socialism. The complete censorship of culture and the state's total control of the press did not help to hide the fact that life was not getting better, and that the standard of living was much higher in Western countries.
Ale jak się wejdzie już na tą ścieżkę socjalizmu, to już nie ma od niej odwrotu. Aż do kryzysu, totalnego kryzysu ekonomicznego. I wtedy dopiero ludzie zaczynają widzieć, że coś nie gra, że coś nie funkcjonuje. Failure of the planned economy, rising prices and the contradiction between propaganda and reality made workers more and more frustrated. Eventually, the workers rose up against the workers' party. State and party responded with violence. It's not only the state that is going bankrupt, but also the myth of the workers' paradise. In the wake of protests in December 1970, the Polish government was taken over by a team of people who decided to stop the constant search for savings and find an impulse for the country's development by stimulating the economy with huge spending. To była wielka nadzieja. My z Gierkiem wiązaliśmy, wiesz, to był człowiek, który przyjechał z zachodu. On był ładnie uczesany, ładnie się ubierał. Miało się wrażenie, że on się o Polskę troszczy. I to, co mu się udało, to załatwić kredyty na rozwój Polski. On miał taki plan, że będzie rozwijał Polskę. The plan was simple. Use money borrowed from Western creditors to buy licenses to produce high-tech products set up huge factories to give work to thousands of workers and drive the economy. If everything went to plan, the state would then be able to repay its debts. In 1970, only 17% of the workforce was working in factories with more than 1,000 employees. Only 10 years later, this figure had risen to more than 70%. At least in the beginning, this meant more and better paying jobs. For six years, the average Pole felt that his standard of living clearly differed from that of the previous generation. My ojciec pojechał w 75 roku do Niemiec, żeby się szkolić w, w, w naprawie maszyn mleczarskich. Przywiózł towary takie jak 12 par rajstop, które dla mnie, dla nastolatki były czymś niewyobrażalnym, były skarbem. Bluzeczki jakieś elastyczne, e, które po prostu e, kolorowe, one zachwycały mnie. Ojciec przywiózł też magnetofon kasetowy. Nikt inny w klasie nie miał oprócz mnie takiego magnetofonu. Powstawały sklepy na przykład z dżinsami zachodnimi. Guma do rzucia się pojawiła w Polsce, tak? To był wielki rarytas. To, co Gierek zrobił, że wpuścił Zachód do Polski, spowodowało wręcz działanie odwrotne, bo ludzie poczuli, Można inaczej. To społeczeństwo rzeczywiście stało się takim u początku konsumpcy, konsumpcji. Nie było wstydliwe mieć, posiadać. Kiedy przez te pięć lat można było więcej towaru kupić, można było troszeczkę więcej pojeździć po świecie, to to wzbudziło nasze apetyty. To on sobie chyba nie zdawał sprawy z tego, co on robi. But the joy lasted only as long as the borrowed money flowed into the economy. Po pięciu, sześciu latach przejedzenia tych pieniędzy nagle ten cały kryzys ekonomiczny no, wrócił z jeszcze zdwojoną siłą. Gigantic workplaces, built according to a top-down plan, did not bring the expected benefits. The planned economy failed. In August 1976, the so-called Kartke system was introduced. From now on, in addition to money, you also need special ration cards to buy goods in regular stores. Nie szedłeś do sklepu i nie mogłeś kupić na przykład butów brązowych rozmiar 43, tylko musiałeś na to mieć kwitek od państwa. Zaczęło się już w 76 roku. Pierwsze kartki były na cukier. Na taki bon, który był ważny dwa tygodnie w miesiącu, można było kupić kilogram cukru. Rządzący, jak już nie wiedzą, co mają zrobić, no to wprowadzają kartki. W latach w 1981 kartki były na wszystko. So this doesn't look bad on the first glance, but I see here this is the monthly supply of goods in the 80s, not in the 50s or in the 60s. This was when, when I was 30 years old. Były kartki na mleko dla dzieci, na proszek do prania, mydło. Tu jest kartka na smalec, na masło, kartki na buty. Mleko w proszku, benzyna, łącznie z dokumentem, który poświadczał, że się ma samochód i że on jest zarejestrowany. 
kaszę, płatki zbożowe na masło, na tłuszcze, na mięso. Kobiety w ciąży miały innego, inne kartki. Mężczyźni pracujący na przykład górnicy mieli zupełnie inne kartki, inne przydziały towarów. Były kartki na papierosy. Osoby, które na przykład nie paliły albo no nie chciały pić wódki, mogły te kartki wymienić na przykład na kawę, której też brakowało. Po pewnym czasie ludzie bardzo szybko nauczyli się te kartki podrabiać, bo one były drukowane wiesz, w bardzo prosty sposób. W związku z tym rządzący wymyślili kartki na kartki. Dostawałeś kartki, które pozwalały ci uzyskać te kartki tak jakby lepsze. Te kartki musiały być rejestrowane w określonych sklepach. Zgubienie takiej kartki było niezwykle bolesne, tak jakby zgubić dowód osobisty, a nawet gorzej w dzisiejszych czasach, ponieważ nie można było niczego kupić bez tego. Over time it turned out that even having money and ration cards was not enough to buy goods. Even if you had enough money and the right government permit, you still needed a lot of time. And here's another landmark institution, the queue. Queues had their own rules. You could leave the queue, go home, go to work. It was important to take your place again at a certain time and confirm your presence in front of the queue committee. If you weren't in line when the list was read out, you were sent to the back. Older family members were sent to stand in line and some people even paid others to stand in line for them. The social system prioritized women with children, so childless women even borrowed children from their friends to skip the queue. And when the long-awaited moment arrives and you reach the front of the queue, you'll take whatever's available if they don't have the shoes that fit your size. To take another pair that doesn't fit, it's easier to swap them on the illegal market with another pair of shoes than to stand in line again. Każdy jak miał jakąś kartkę, to starał się koniecznie wykupić ten towar, potrzebował czy nie, ponieważ każdy towar był cenny, bo można go było wymienić na inny towar. Nie wiem, czy to przypadkiem nie powodowało też marnotrawstwa, bo ludzie na wszelki wypadek wykupywali te tak zwane przydziały po to, żeby mieć. Lokata w towar jakikolwiek była na pewno lepsza niż w dewaluującą się ciągle złotówkę i potem między sobą ludzie się wymieniali. Tutaj pieniądz nie grał roli, bo za pieniądze nie zawsze mogłeś kupić. Była szansa kupienia pralki automatycznej. Myśmy stali w kolejce, trzeba było w tej kolejce stać cały czas i moja żona, która była wtedy chyba w szóstym czy siódmym miesiącu ciąży, po prostu musiała przestać, bo, bo tak wyszło, tak nie, nie było komu stać. No i ona siedziała w samochodzie po prostu przez północy, tam pojechała na dwunastą i o szóstej rano kto się, kto się zmienił, tak? Bo to była taka kolejka społeczna, tam była taka lista, trzeba było być obecnym, no, no po prostu katastrofa. Nie tylko, że nie ma tych pralek, ale jak już będziesz tym szczęśliwcem, że nabędziesz tą pralkę, to wcale nie znaczy, że ta pralka będzie działać, bo może się okazać, że jest uszkodzona. Taka gospodarka braku staje się przyczyną no, bardzo złych mechanizmów społecznych. Rodzi wśród ludzi niechęć, nienawiść, zabija po prostu, nie wiem, relacje społeczne. To był albo 80., albo 81 rok. Cztery godziny stałem, żeby kupić litr mleka i pół e, bochenka chleba. And while you could spend up to a week in line outside a store, waiting to get your phone connected took years. Były budki telefoniczne na ulicach, ale były czymś bardzo też rzadkim. Czekało się 2, 3 i 4 godziny do telefonu. Załatwienie jakiejkolwiek sprawy telefonicznej to właściwie było cały dzień zmarnowany. In 1987, only 12% of Poles had a telephone compared to 16% in 1989 in the GDR and 99% in West Germany. It was the same with cars. In Poland, only 14% of the population owned a car in 1990, compared with 68% in West Germany in 1989. In Poland, you had to wait several years to buy a new car if you had the chance to buy one at all. Of course, you could buy a used one, but sometimes it was even more expensive than a new one. Even high-ranking party comrades, 
who often received car vouchers, had to wait years to pick up their cars from the factory. And when they did, they usually took a mechanic with them because there was no guarantee that their new car would actually start. There were two products that were very deficit. One was paper toilet and the other was a snow pack. What's interesting, to ludzie, którzy chodzili z tymi girlandami papieru toaletowego, jak go już zdobyli, to mieli ten sznurek właśnie do snopowiązajek przeciągnięty przez ten papier toaletowy. Time and again there were attempts to reform the socialist economy. Each reform promised the higher standard of living in exchange for temporary sacrifices. Over time the reforms themselves needed to be reformed. And sometimes reforms even made people's lives worse. It became more and more obvious that reforming socialism was not possible. Poland enters the 1980s in the grip of the worst crisis in years. In 1981, national income fell by 22% year on year. W 80 roku już była olbrzymia taka świadomość związana z tym, że komunizm jest jednym wielkim oszustwem. W pewnym momencie na tych półkach już nic nie było. Był tylko ocet. Stały butelki octu na dole. Aż tu pewnego dnia zniknęło to wszystko. Rozniosło się już po całym osiedlu, że już nawet octu nie ma w sklepie. To nie jest państwo, które służy robotnikom, klasie robotniczej. The biggest centers of the revolt were the gigantic factories that were built or enlarged with foreign debt. It was in these places that trade unions were born and they are the first to dare to organize and stand up to the authorities. Strajki zaczęły się od braku towarów, od podwyżek tego, co uderzało rzeczywiście w robotników, bo oni najmniej zarabiali. Niektórzy ludzie słuchali Radia Wolna Europa czy, czy jakiś tam BBC po angielsku. Propaganda w tym momencie utraciła moc swojego rażenia. In December of the same year, the authorities introduced martial law for two years. Pracowałem w Stalowej Woli, a to była jedna z jedno z centrum, gdzie były też strajki. Pamiętam taki moment, kiedy helikoptery nadleciały nad ludzi, którzy wychodzili z pracy i tak przyduszały ich pędem powietrza, żeby się pokładli, tak żeby pokazać właśnie pewnego rodzaju siłę. The government does not return to talks with the opposition until 1988. The situation in the country has not improved. Another reform that increases wages while raising prices causes an inflationary spiral. And then the last reform within the socialist system is launched, when all other attempts to save socialism have failed. The government decides to free the market. And even some communists begin to understand that capitalism is not the problem, it may be the solution. At the end of 1988, Parliament appoints Mieczysław Wilczek as Minister of Industry. Wilczek was a long-time party member, but he was also a chemist and a very successful businessman. In December 1988, the Act on the Freedom of Business Activity was introduced. And when roundtable talks are held between the authorities and the opposition, the government decides to end price controls and abolish meat rationing. And this is the end of the ration card system. Zaczęły pojawiać się sklepy komercyjne. Można było pewne towary za większe pieniądze, ale jednak kupić. To było potwornie drogie. Ludzi nie było stać, ale był Bo po prostu wszystko mogłeś kupić, wszystko było sprowadzane z całego świata. Przywozili różne dziwne rzeczy, od kożuchów poczynając gdzieś tam z Rumunii czy Bułgarii, poprzez właśnie różne ciuchy z Tajlandii. Ten niesamowity dostęp do różnych, różnych towarów. Ja pamiętam swoje pierwsze szalone wrażenie, kiedy dotarła do mnie butelka z fantą. A do tej pory mam sentyment do, 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 do kolorowej fanty, bo pamiętam tą, tą swoją radość z tej butelki. Citrus fruits are no longer something you wait for once a year. Now they are waiting for you in stores all year round. The reforms were groundbreaking, but they didn't cover everything. 
it isn't enough to simply let people trade. Of course you have to. But what if the state is still dealing with corrupt, unreal money? And what if we have an inflation rate of more than 600% per year? The success of Vilcek's reforms makes everyone hungry for more. And it is thanks to the unleashed human energy and the obvious improvements in people's living conditions that people decide to support the most difficult reforms in Poland's history. We started when totally state-controlled economy, which in addition was struck by happy inflation. It was not 20% a year, it was 20% a month. 1989, Poland was one of the poorest countries in Europe. On average, Poles earned less than $50 a month, not even 10% of what people in West Germany were earning. People in Poland were even poorer than the average citizen in Gabon, Ukraine or Suriname. And Poland lagged behind its communist peers. The GDP per capita was only half of that in Czechoslovakia. In September 1989, the Sejm appointed a government led by Tadosz Mazowiecki, who was looking for someone to help get the economy on the right track. Poland happened to be the first country to abandon central planned economy, which was in a desperate condition. Overwhelming majority of Polish people recognized that Poland became free of Soviet domination, and most people accepted radical stabilization and liberalization. Balcerowicz's team faced the task of reforming a system whose hallmarks were soaring inflation, empty shelves, long queues, huge deficits and a massive foreign debt. One added complication besides hyperinflation was that we are a bankrupt country. We were very heavy in debt, which were incurred in the 70s. And I knew that without debt reduction, Poland could not develop. But debt reduction depended on our radical program. Over 20 years, foreign debt had ballooned from $1 billion to 40, which was the largest debt in this part of Europe. The cost of servicing this debt exceeded the total value of Poland's exports. Radical program stabilization, liberalization was absolutely necessary to rescue Poland's economy and to get debt reduction. Finally, we got 50% debt reduction for our Western creditors. After an initial increase, as prices became more realistic, inflation dropped from 585 to 70% in 1991. And by the end of the decade, it was as low as 7.3%. One of the important signs was that prices of some key goods, X, started to fall. I remember communicating in the media, X are becoming cheaper. Critics of the reforms claim that one side effect was unemployment. But it's important to know that in all socialist countries, official statistics were fake. Officially, there was zero unemployment in the Soviet Union, Poland and other socialist countries. Even people who are not engaged in any meaningful economic activity were counted as employed. It's hard to get the exact numbers. But hidden unemployment may have been as high as 20 to 30 percent. Ukryte bezrobocie. Kopiesz rów, a twój kolega go zasypuje. Czyli do tego ukrytego bezrobocia, które było potrzebne komunistom tylko po to, żeby się chełpić, że u nich jest 100 zatrudnienia, no to był to mechanizm, który po prostu rujnował gospodarkę. Konsumował, a niczego nowego nie wytwarzał. Funkcjonowało takie nawet powiedzenie w tych czasach, że oni udają, że nam płacą, a my udajemy, że pracujemy. Even the communist leaders told each other jokes about the supposedly non-existent unemployment. In 1987, General Jaroszelski met the Soviet leader Gorbachev and told him that Poland's problems were partly caused by the fiction of full employment. And he illustrated this with a joke. Two guys are pushing the same wheelbarrow and someone asks them, why are the two of you doing that? Because the third guy is on sick leave. Unemployment rose from zero to 12% in 1991 and then again to 14% in 1992 
before remaining at that level for the next few years. After the end of socialism, hidden unemployment became official unemployment. It was inevitable that some of the people who had been working in state-owned enterprises, which were nowhere near competitive enough for global markets and had not been allowed to go bankrupt due to state subsidies, would now lose their jobs. Unemployment was no longer hidden in fake statistics. Introducing capitalism brought about diversification, especially in the growth of the processing industries. After the reforms were introduced, all the problems that were hidden by the system suddenly came to light. A potem zaczęło się realne życie, zaczęła się prawda życiowa. Nagle spadły te wszystkie fałszywe, fałszywe dekoracje. To do życia okazało się niezwykle bolesne, ale oczywiście to był skutek całego tego systemu komunistycznego, tylko to trzeba było umieć zrozumieć, no nie każdy to jest w stanie pojąć. Rynek możesz zniszczyć w ciągu jednego dnia, ale żeby go odbudować, w Polsce to zajęło około 10, 10 lat. Between 1990 and 1993, more than one million new firms were created. Many of them were founded by former workers of large factories. Others found work in these new companies. After all, it was possible to act, employ and produce guided by profit. It no longer depended on the party's good grace, but on meeting consumers' needs. And consumers' needs were almost endless. And so, contrary to the legends about the collapse of industry between 1990 and 2018, industrial production increased by almost 300% and processing by 484%. Production begins to meet not only internal needs, there's also an increase in the export of goods. Over the past 30 years, exports have grown more than fivefold. Poland became attractive for foreign investors. While in 1989, foreign companies invested $60 million in Poland, the number had increased by 1993 to 1 1.5 billion and the standard of living rose. In less than five years, the number of hi-fis and color TVs doubled. And the number of people who owned a VCR rose from less than one to almost 14%. The number of farmers who owned a car rose from 30 to 42%. And the number of retiree households who owned a car rose from 9 to 15%. From the time of the reforms to the present day, Poland has moved faster than any other post-communist country. In 1989, GDP per capita was 30% of the US. In 2016, it was almost 50%. Poland grew even faster than heavily subsidized East Germany. The economy grew faster than the Asian Tigers, South Korea, Malaysia and Singapore. With continuous growth over a period of 25 years, it beat all of these countries. Poland has had the fastest growing economy in Europe since the 1989 reforms and is widely regarded as Europe's growth champion. There is a reason for this astonishing growth. In hardly any other country of comparable size has economic freedom increased so much in recent decades. In the index of economic freedom, Poland ranks 39. Although Poland is more economically free than France, Italy, Spain or Israel, it doesn't occupy a top position in the index. But of far greater importance than the absolute rank of the country is the relative change in economic freedom since 1995. Poland started with a score of 50.7 in 1995 and rose up to 69.7 in 2021. Of all countries with more than 30 million inhabitants, only Vietnam experienced a comparable increase in economic freedom. While in general everyone has benefited from the transformation of the Polish economy, it did not make everyone automatically wealthy. The income of the richest 10% of society increased by as much as 135%. Average salaries increased by 100% and the lowest by 40%. People are different. 
and not everyone could adapt to the new conditions to the same extent. But the great majority of Poles were better off than in the days of socialism, even the relatively poor. And a lot of people rose up from the lower class to the middle class. This is called social mobility. Intuitively, it would seem that a growing economy should place a greater burden on the environment. In Poland, however, even in the first years after the reforms were introduced, there were visible reductions in river and air pollution. The waste of resources characteristic of a centrally planned government was also not very good for the environment. Economic growth in Poland is like that of any other developed capitalist countries. Their growth is decoupled from CO2 emissions, which is quite crucial for the issue of climate change. CO2 emissions rose sharply in the 1960s and 1970s. Even in the late 1980s, per capita emissions still exceeded 11 metric tons. The transition to capitalism changed this picture significantly and, in less than 10 years, per capita emissions fell to around 8 metric tons. At the same time, businesses became more efficient, which meant CO2 emissions declined as GDP per capita steadily increased. And even today, emissions have held steady at around 8 metric tons per capita, which is indeed remarkable considering how much the economy in Poland has grown since then. 30 years after the transition from socialism to a market economy, Poland is richer, more modern, and has cleaner rivers and air. And Poles are much happier today. According to Poles, in 2015, 80% of Poles were satisfied with their lives. In 1992, it was only 50%. And life expectancy, which was only 71 years in 1990, increased to 79 years in 2020. Until recently, uh, we did not have a very strong opposition against market reform, reforms in Poland. And in 2016-17, there was no going back. But in today's government propaganda, the period of pro-market reforms is portrayed as a time when Poland went from good to bad, regardless of what history, statistics and objective data say. But most of the Poles are smarter than the government and propaganda. A survey conducted in 33 countries in 2021 and 2022 by the internationally renowned polling institute Ipsos Mori shows that capitalism has a better image in Poland than in any other country, even better than in the USA. And although some politicians spread slogans of envy against the rich, and of course there are some people in Poland who are envious of the rich, an international survey in 13 countries shows that social envy is less widespread in Poland than in all other countries in the survey. In many countries, economic upswings were followed by a change in the attitudes towards the rich. And the same is true for Poland. I commissioned a poll in Asia, United States and Europe, and we asked people how important is it for you to become rich? And in Poland, 49% of our respondents said that it's really important for them to become rich. Now you should compare it with the result in other countries. In Europe, other European countries and United States, it was only 28% of the respondents who said that it's important for them to become rich. So Poland is much closer to Asian countries where people are so ambitious and in Asia, on average, even 58% of the people said that it's really important for them to become rich. The example of Poland shows the power of capitalist reforms to improve the lives of ordinary people in a country, and that sometimes reforms need to be enacted quickly and radically. At such a crucial stage in its history, Poland was fortunate to be led by politicians who had a clear free market compass. The history of Poland from 1990 to 2020 shows capitalism is not the problem, but the solution. I admire the Poles who were the first to fight against socialism and to finalize the transition from socialism to capitalism. The Poles can be proud of this. Poland showed that fighting poverty means fighting for economic freedom. And I hope 
that they will not forget why they were so successful. Other nations can learn a lot from the rise of the White Eagle.